and you're a teenage nerd. I suspect for many of us here tonight, that's not too much of a stretch of the imagination or memory. But imagine you're a teenage nerd 40 years ago. No Facebook, no instant messaging, no internet, no cell phones, no computers smaller than a two-car garage. All the essential glues that make it easy for nerds to seek out new nerds and new nerd civilizations. They did not exist. There were movies, there were comics, there were science fiction and fantasy books, but there were, those were solitary pursuits. You read the book, you watched the movie, you didn't talk during the movie. You could watch TV with other people, but TV had three channels if you were lucky. Gunsmoke was still on. The sci-fi series of the 60s had petered out. By 1974, Fantastic on the Tube was Planet of the Apes and Six Million Dollar Man, and they were scheduled opposite each other on Friday night. There were no VCRs. Kolchak, the Night Stalker, came on later Friday. You could talk about books and magazines and movies and TV, but mostly you did these things alone. If you wanted to do something together, actually interact with other nerds in some sort of activity, sedentary as it might have been, there was chess. So that was like an infinite percentage increase in the amount of nerd interactivity, but it was still just two nerds. Scrabble, four nerds max. Then... At the cusp of the 70s, some older nerds who were playing with miniature, well, <clears throat> let's just be honest and call them toy soldiers, and thought it would be cool to add in dragons and sorcerers to their intricately staged medieval war games. I'm guessing they were high. That led to a fantasy supplement for Chainmail, a thin booklet about how to conduct large battles and hand-to-hand -hand combat for tabletop miniatures, which used dice to determine the outcomes of battles. Then, in a sort of simultaneous step Players took on the part of individual people instead of squads, battalions, or armies. The abstraction of strategic war games with elaborate rule systems and randomized combat resolution had merged with the freeform storytelling wor world of Barbies and G.I. Joes to spawn role-playing games. Now, nerds were working together toward a shared goal. For me, Dungeons & Dragons arrived at the perfect time. I was a 13-year-old high school freshman. My friend John Pitchford and I scraped together five bucks a piece and bought a copy of the original box set. It was a lot of rules compared to, say, Monopoly, but they were remarkably sparse about what actually happened during the game. If you hadn't been initiated into the mechanics of role-playing games by someone who'd almost certainly learned how things worked from somebody else, you were as lost as a first-level cleric in the Temple of the Frog because there was no explanation of what you actually did or what the goal was. The first editions of D&D were still oriented toward playing with miniatures on a large-scale tabletop with movement expressed in inches. An ochre jelly that could only move three inches a turn doesn't sound so scary, does it? The term Dungeon Master doesn't even appear in the early versions of the rules. The game's run by someone called the Referee. Role-playing back then was as unmapped as any virgin dungeon, or Dungeon of Virgins. I was lucky to be close to the ground floor of the D&D boom. I wasn't on the front lines at TSR with Gary Gygax. I was, never had the money to go to Gen Con, the big gaming convention held in D&D's hometown. But because the shop I hung out at was the Northwest distributor for D&D, another fantasy game called Tunnels and Trolls, a sci-fi RPG called Traveler and even Lead Miniatures, I got exposure to a wide variety of material, and there was a lot of it. I even got into it a little bit myself writing a scathing satire of high school cliques disguised as a monster class for the official D&D magazine when I was a high school senior. Ah, bitter youth. A lot of the money that's spent on video games and systems these days was going to buy this stuff, which attracted a couple kinds of attention. Thirty years ago this spring, I was invited by the Springfield Public Library's children's librarian to give a talk to some kids about D&D. A week before the talk, I got a call from her saying that a local youth pastor had threatened to pick it if he wasn't allowed to address the helpless souls before I went on. There were about a dozen 10 to 12 year old boys in the audience and almost that many high school kids from the church group. The pastor talked for 20 minutes on the evils of witchcraft, how people spent thousands of dollars on suits of armor and the perils that awaited them should they play D&D. I could only counter with the fact that not only did I not believe in magic or witches, but my $3.35 an hour job in the bookstore didn't exactly put me in the position of spending thousands of dollars on anything. I'd written to TSR for advice on how to approach it, but the response came too late, and there really wasn't much they could recommend. D&D was one of the first structures for nerdy kids to collaborate in cooperative situations without the need for adult handlers. Like youth fads from the comics of the 50s to Harry Potter, it came under attack from forces purporting it flaunted the social order. I haven't played D&D for more than 25 years, but I'm kind of glad it was there. <laughs> 